When I was really starting to uh, to understand what I needed to do to, to play jazz, and I had an argument with a couple of saxophone player friends about how to approach learning how to solo and learning how to play jazz. And, Wayne Shorter was playing in Los Angeles, and we all went to the show. And after the show, he was very accommodating. And uh, Wayne Shorter tends to speak in the, he speaks it's in English the words cryptic, you know, speaks in paradoxes and circles and crazy shit. So uh, the guy said, well, Wayne, if, if you had one piece of advice for us, what, what should we understand about music? And Wayne says, well, you must understand that notes are like people and that you have to go up the steps and greet every one of them. And nobody knew what that meant. So the guy comes uh, to him with, the, with, the, with a chart and says, like, see right here on this chart when you played this? And Wayne says, man, I don't want to see that, man. What are, you, what are you doing? You just need to learn how to walk up the steps and greet each note. So uh, I had a recording. I said, well, let me play this solo for you. Wayne's one of Wayne's solos when he's playing with Miles, playing uh, Stella by Starlight. And he said, now listen to the solo. And then he says, uh, you know, go up the steps. You know, and he played something that ascended. And he says, now you go down the steps. And then he played something that descended. And I went, oh, God, that's OK. And uh, when we finished listening to the solo, the guys kept asking him technical questions. And he says, look. And he says, like, rhythm changes. You guys know rhythm changes, right? And he says, this is how Lester did it. And he played some Lester Young phrases. And then he said, this is how Bird did it. And he played Bird's phrases. He says, this is how Train did it. And he played like Train. And he says, now this is how Wayne does it. And then he played his. And then he left. <laughs> and, but, I, but, but I got it, you know. I got it. Well, what I got out of it was that I had to go and learn some Lester Young and some Charlie Parker and some Coltrane and really understand these solos because Wayne was like my all-time great hero. And I thought I knew a lot about his music, but it was clear to me that if, 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 you don't, if I didn't go through the process that Wayne went through. So uh, when I started learning all these other solos, then I started to understand Wayne's playing a lot better. I did practice on sound, but it's, it's more about, I would learn solos from guys who had big sounds. So, you know, Coleman Hawkins or uh, Ben Webster, and try to emulate those sounds. Sonny Rollins, and then I had one setup, and I said, well, this isn't working. So then I'd go to a larger setup, try to try different reads, try to see if I could get something to approximate that sound. I didn't really do sound exercises. Uh, it's more about, using music to change the sound that you have in your head. Because ultimately, you're going to sound the way that you hear yourself, no matter how many times you change your mouthpiece. So if you, I used to have a, a brighter sound. So I started listening to musicians who didn't have that, and then I was able to change how I hear the sound in my head. Because that's really what it comes down to. You change your mouthpiece, and in, in a week you sound just like the, the the same person. You can change anything; it won't matter. It doesn't matter. That's not where it comes from. It's not the gear. It's not the gear. You can you're gonna go right back to what it is you do, because you, you, your brain will find a way to use physical alterations to create that sound. So to me, you have to ch you have to change the way that that you hear. And I think the best way to do that is re with recordings. There's a difference between playing an instrument and playing music. Those are two separate things. And, and, and you, they need to be separated because you have uh, technical issues on an instrument that you have to overcome. But you have to get away from the idea that 
the technical issues is actually what the music is about, because it's not. The music's not about that. So I listen to a lot of musicians who are great at it, and I just try to emulate them or uh, be inspired by them. And as I got older, I started to understand. Uh, you know, I, I read things. You know, there's a book called Meet the Composer that I read that was really great. Uh, they were interviewing uh, classical composers from... from 1950, 1940, 1947, actually. So uh, Darius Mio was in there, and Stravinsky was in there. And, I mean, they're, they're pretty unified in their talk. Like, music is about people. It's, it's our interpretation of their lives. And the harmony and all those things are good and important and necessary, but that's not the music. The music is how do people feel when they hear the music? What do they walk away with? Because when you, when you start thinking about your career and realizing that and any concert that you do, 95% of the audience doesn't play an instrument. And when you really understand that, it changes your perception about what it is you're doing. So then when we start talking in the band, it's like, man, what are these songs about? Songs have to be about something other than some chord changes. It has to be about a human condition. Songs have to be about happiness. Romantic songs have to be really romantic. Sad songs have to be really, really sad. You know, and, and, you, and then you notice, I was about 37 years old when somebody said, you played that ballad tonight and, and it made me cry. Darius Mio, the French composer, he said, he said, uh, any good student of music can develop a brilliant technique. He says, you know, they all do it. Everybody's competent in that. He says, but it just doesn't mean anything. He says, the most important thing that a com composer can do in our time is write a song that has a melody that so strikes a listener that it's almost like they feel they have to put it in their pocket and they walk around whistling it all day. That's the power of what we do. So we have all of this information and we have all of this stuff, but then we have to distill all of this stuff to this essence where regular people can say, whoa, you know? And that's what, what, what Kinda Blue did and that's what Coltrane did with My Favorite Things and that's what, what uh, Brubeck did on Take Five is you have all this information, you have all this stuff and you just condense it and you distill it to a simple idea. And it doesn't mean that every song has to be like that, but something has to be like that. And when concerts are over, people will come out and say, man, I really love the third song. And they mean it. They might think the rest of it was shit. But you gave them one thing that they can hold on to. And then the music students will say, man, I love the fourth song because it was complicated and it moved all over the place. So you have this situation where you have different parts of the audience reacting to different things at different times. And, and, and I think that that's a, that's, that's a successful formula for playing music and having people pay money because as much as they're supposed to be hearing you, they're also seeing you. It's just, it's just a reality. And if you, and you, you need to start thinking you know, in those terms. Like People are paying money to see this crap. What are we going to give them? And, and, and that, that's when, around 1990, was when I started thinking it. And it took a long time after that, mostly because I, if I hadn't gone on that television show, I might have got there five years sooner. But I did this television show, and then when we left the show, it was like starting all over again. Oh, where were we? Oh, yeah, learning how to play ballads, right. You know, it's like one of those things.
to me, uh, in, in a combo, jazz is a conversation. And like you and I are talking right now, I mean, you didn't go home and extract some sentences from a piece you like and tell them to me now. You ask me a question, I have an answer. I ask you a question, you have an answer. And that's what music is to me. We should be having a conversation and the conversation should be as unprepared as possible. You know, so it's, it's like listening to Sonny Rollins. That's why he's the greatest improviser in the history of jazz. Because when you listen to him, it's like he learned all of these, he learned all of the technical stuff, the patterns and the scales and all of that. And then he learned 10,000 songs that are so ridiculous. You hear him play songs that are so far removed from what jazz is, circus songs, classical pieces, and they just come out in his solos at times. And you say, what the hell is that? And it might be years before I figure out what the song is. And what it is is that he, he has so much information in his head that he can talk about anything. And the song can start, and he just starts playing. And it, it goes in directions where you don't anticipate. Whereas with other guys, they have this conversation, and it's an amazing conversation, but they tend to repeat the conversation a lot. And we tend to call repetition consistency. And you say, oh, that guy's really consistent, when all it is is it's the same shit over and over again. It's regurgitation. That's what it is. It's not improvisation. Improvisation is supposed to be improvised, not repeated over and over and over again in every song in 12 different keys. Now, there are guys, in it, and, and that's the only way they can approach it. And you say, okay, well, great. That's just not what I want to do. You know, I, I don't think that everybody in the world should uh, embrace my philosophy, but my philosophy works for me. And I wanna, when I'm on stage playing, I, wanna, I want it to be as fresh. I want I, I, I to surprise the guys in the band too. And they'll hear something go, oh, where'd you get that from? And, I, and it's true. I, say, I don't know. It just, you know, you learn all this music and it sits in there and then it comes out whenever it feels like. And sometimes it surprises you. I like that method. It works for me. Yes? Yeah. Harvey Patel. He's a saxophone player. Uh, he, he teaches out of the University of Texas. He looked at me play and he says, you're never going to play the saxophone well that way. <laughs> no, what he actually said was, he, he watched me play and he goes, I think you're probably one of the most amazing saxophone players I've ever heard. I said, really? He says, yeah, I'm amazed that you can get any sound at all out of that thing with all the bad things you have going on. And I said, cool, that's why I pay you, come on. You know? and, and he starts, horn has to be higher. He says, it can never be high enough. Every time you think it's high, hike it some more. When you play the saxophone low, like the, the, the air coming through the mouthpiece should be coming through this way. When the horn is low, it comes in this way. So what you notice is that as you start going down to the lower parts of the instrument, it's more difficult to get the notes out because you're basically, the, the English is shunting you're shunting the air column, which makes more overtones increase. So as you start playing low, they tend to go up an octave. So the solution is to start subtoning on the low notes, dropping your jaw real low to get the sound out. So it goes da 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 foo 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 foo. But when you start raising, then you realize you can go da 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 da. And then subtone is optional. It's a sound effect, not a requirement to get the note out. And you listen to all those old jazz records, and the guys play real low, and they can't play in the lower register. But if you see pictures of Charlie Parker, horn is high. See pictures of Coltrane, horn is high.